I think that's there's some people here. It's great. Um, what I want to talk about today is something that's, I mean, I got very interested in deep learning a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it's obvious what the capabilities of what it can do. Um, but I'm someone who always wants to understand what's going on inside whatever I'm doing. Uh, and I found that, well, you know, on some level you can understand it, but on other levels, maybe not. Maybe it's, 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 it's really quite difficult. And so what I want to do today is to talk about a way to uh, use TDA kind of methods to generate understanding of what's going on. In our case, we'll do some simple things to, today with uh, convolutional neural nets. Okay, let's see here. Um, there we go. Okay. This is there. You got to pick over that. Got okay. So you just hit. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So deep learning. Uh, very powerful methodology. I think it's people would agree mostly that what's going on under the hood is not always so clear. Um, it's necessary to gain uh, understanding for many different reasons. Some involve justification of results and uh, just simply giving people some comfort to it. But another, another aspect is simply making the model smaller. So there are many situations now where you have some models that maybe work well in the lab but can't be put on a, uh, on a cell phone. Uh, and the idea of trying to compress the models is important as well. Um, so we're going to try to present a way to get some understanding. So, So what, is, what do we mean by understanding? Well, uh, we could try to sort of could think of the weights in a CNN, convolutional neural net, the set of weights is, is a, some huge formula uh, that's computing uh, values of a function or of a classifier. So the weight form of vectors can be thought of as formulae. And what I'll do is I'll think, let me just identify the, the data we're going to be looking at. We're going to be taking a convolutional neural net and we're going to be looking at the weights that come into a particular <laughs> node. So if I imagine I have two convolutional layers of the same size, and I have one of the uh, pixels, and the one, it's only, um, it's got nine weights attached to it. Say, so if, if, uh, if I build the network in such a way that I connect only one, uh, you know, one spot away in the box. So we're going to think of a data set. We're going to think of trying to understand the set of those vectors, those nine vectors. We call those weight vectors. Um, now, this is a very noisy situation, so this is not something where you can get away from you know, statistics and so on, at least in its crude form. You need to understand this is really a data analytic problem, which means in particular that it's important to understand density of things. You know, there are obviously sparse phenomena that are all over the place, but they're not, they're not very dense. Uh, question is, is it consistent with behavior of the mammalian brain, and what can it tell us about the large-scale organization? So, and, and what I want to tell you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a parallel with a, a study that we did uh, some uh, well, 15 years ago now, which is the study, it's the statistics of three by three patches in natural images. So if you imagine you take an image, um, and I can, it, it's encoded as a pixel array, I can take the three by three pixel arrays in there, uh, and that's also, the, those are nine vectors. Studying that is very is interesting, but there are a couple of things about it. One is that there's some massively dense thing, which is the constant ones, the patches that are the constant thing. You're not very interested in those once you understand them, so you remove them. But then, even within that, we want to understand only the densest, the most frequently occurring motifs in there. Because in that, in that analysis, there's also tons of stuff. Everything under the sun happens, but you need to understand the dense stuff. Okay? And so that was what we tried to study, the high variance patches, uh, the densest such patches. And we were trying to understand at that time how this uh, connected with uh, the tuning of neurons in the primary visual cortex. So at a first level, what we found was that the data was organized around a circle. And the way we found this was through these kind of uh, persistent homology techniques that are a part of TDA that allow you to measure the shape of data. And we found this. This is not such a surprising finding if you think about it. This is just saying that, look, if you have some patches that are varying, then linear gradients at an angle, the angle is the parameter, are the first and likely thing that happens. And so it did, and that was nice. Uh, we found that we wanted to 
change and see if it was robust to change of density estimator. So we made a more localized density estimator. And it turns out then a different thing came out, um, the so-called three-circle model. Uh, you'll notice here, here's the primary one that we looked at before, but then there are these two secondary ones that are, consist of vertical and horizontal patches that include now lines in the middle of regions at an angle as well. And it turns out that, you know, even more to the point, if I relax my density threshold a little bit, I actually get uh, this Klein bottle, uh, which is quite interesting and it's turned out to be uh, quite useful, both from the point of view of building compression schemes and also texture recognition. Anyway, that was the study uh, that we did. And the question was, is, some, is that somehow replicated or reflected in the, the structure of these weight vectors in the convolutional neural nets? Okay, let, let me just say the primary visual cortex is the lowest level. Uh, one knows that there are higher levels. Uh, Hubel and Wiesel showed that individual neurons detect edges and lines. Individual neurons detecting something is a reflection of some kind of compression going on. In other words, if there's something that happens frequently, you want to represent it by a small number of bits, uh, one bit in this case, a uh, neuron. Uh, and so they, sh they showed that that occurred in that primary visual cortex. But again, there's higher levels of organization that people don't know very much, well, I shouldn't say that, but they know less about than they know about V1, which is the primary visual cortex. Um, so the question is, do we, can we see similarities of the weight vectors with what we found in the image patch data? Can we see what's happening as the network learns? Can we see how that, what, what, what's going on over time? Because we can examine the, the, that the space. And the question also, what are the responsibilities of the various layers? You know, in the human, the, the thinking is in the human side, you know, the, the, the retina captures the, the images, the V1 captures <coughs> Uh, the, the low level local features, and then you get as you go farther up, you get more abstract and, and different features. Okay. So, again, we're going to talk about these nine vectors. We're going to perform the exact same analysis, including density filtering. And let me tell you what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you, well, these are the data sets, first of all. Um, but um, I'm going to show you a representation of the data from two points of view. One from the point of view of Mapper. So Mapper is a method for taking any data set and constructing from it a graphical representation that encodes effectively the similarities in the data set. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it's obtained by you take a projection onto the real line from the data, take overlapping intervals, and take their inverse images. You notice they overlap. I cluster now, not the whole data set, but each bin I cluster. Um, and so what I will get then is a bunch of nodes. You might think this is just a clustering. It's a soft clustering because the nodes can overlap. And what I will do is I will connect any two nodes that share a data point. So, and so here I've built the model. And it doesn't quite show up at the bottom of the edges there for some reason, but it's a hexagon. And it effectively represents that circle. Now, this is an overly optimistic view. It doesn't always happen perfectly like that. But nevertheless, it it's almost always gives information in one kind or another. Okay. Okay. So now here's a picture of what sorry, of what happened in the with MNIST in the sort of the very first layer of a uh, of a depth two net. First number. So. What you'll notice here is, first of all, it comes out the mapper representation is a circle. And in fact, when you go through and look at the representative parts, one of the things you can do is just take a part here and select it and see what's in there. And what you find is it's exactly the same thing that we saw in the primary circle in the analysis of the image patches. But now you might say, well, you did this mumbo jumbo with mapper. How do I know? How can I measure? How can I say that there actually is? A loop there. Maybe you know. Maybe you just built this for slideware. But here is the. This is a so-called persistent homology measure. So not every. Perhaps not everyone is familiar. Persistent homology is a tool that provides a so-called barcode or persistence diagram output 
that captures aspects of the shape. So in this case, this particular barcode here is one that's tuned or is designed to capture the presence of loops. And what you can see is it's got a long bar. That means there's a loop. OK. So all right, so very good, right? That gives us uh, uh, you know, a lot. Tells us that at least at that, at that uh, first layer, that's what happens. Now, we tried to do some other things with other data sets. Um, this here was a more localized density estimator. So we tried to do initially, and we'll come back to this in a bit, but uh, we tried to do the same thing that we did so as to get that three circle model uh, for in the case of MNIST. And it sort of works, but not really. It'll, we'll see it much better defined in, in the future. But it points out some of the difficulties here. Um, and this is CIFAR 10, which is another data set. Here you can see it's a little bit complicated. Again, this is just a two-layer net. But here, and this was CIFAR 10, but now we're in the second layer. And this, in this case, we reduced it to grayscale. So CIFAR 10 comes with color, we reduced it to, uh, to grayscale. And what you can see happens is, oh, the CIFAR is picking up the primary circle, but it's got something in the middle here, and the thing in the middle is not one of those lines or the secondary circle kind of things. It's instead this uh, kind of a um, bullseye. Okay. Kind of interesting. Yeah, and this is the persistent homology calculation for that. Okay, now, <clears throat> so one a question I asked is what happens during the learning? Okay. Um, so, and this is now CIFAR 10, this is watching what's happening here. And, and what you can see is, now this is a map of representation, you'll notice it looks like a carpet. In, in many cases, but it's also colored by number of points, data points in a node. So that's kind of a proxy for density. So what you can see is you start out with something that's roughly random, and now the first layer is rather rapidly organizing itself into a primary circle. In fact, it gets to this point, and it's, you know, it's a pretty nice primary circle. Everything down here, the second layer is not doing anything. Okay. Okay, but now what something interesting happens, this is starting to degrade. This circle is starting to degrade a little bit. See, I mean, it's, uh, and as I go further, it degrades even further. There's something in the middle here that's developing, and I'm losing stuff around the boundary to where I've just got the four corners. As I'm doing that, as it's starting to degrade, you can see a little, little bit here that this secondary circle Second, sorry, this second layer is starting to develop a little bit of a circular thing around the boundary. And then here you get further to where down at this bottom layer it's producing something which is really definitely not a primary circle. The red stuff here is not a primary circle. And down here, this one is. So what's happened is that the second layer has taken over the responsibility for the primary circle and at the first layer, you know, you're capturing these four corner points, and then something here is in the middle. It's probably this bullseye thing. Thank you. So, um, okay. So now let's see here. Uh, now here's here's C510. This is the coarse density thresholding, and this is with the color retained. So here we get a nice primary circle as well. But now what happens here is that if I take uh, a more localized density threat estimator and a looser density thresholding. This is in CIFAR 10 now. This is something which is not images. This is, uh, I should say, not images of numbers. This is images of objects. But what you can see here is that you've actually recovered um, that, what I would call that three circle model. So here is the, the primary gradients, and then here are the two secondary things that have vertical and horizontal. And again, persistent homology is capturing it here. This says you have five loops. Five bars means five loops. And this one, if you look at it, uh, you'll, you can see that it, it actually has five loops. Okay. okay. Uh, let me just move since we're running out of time. Oop, oop. Um, here's an analysis of a much deeper network. 
And this, I think, is probably more representative of what you know. So, um, so this is VGG 16. So what you'll notice is you've got primary circle, primary circle in the first couple of layers and nothing but. And then over time, you start to capture, here's some secondary circle stuff, um, bullseye, and so on. So that one can see uh, that when you allow the network is deep enough, that when the network is deep enough, it does seem to distribute the responsibilities uh, for, for the various layers to the more abstract things as I'm, as I'm growing. Um, notice, though, that everybody here always has a primary circle. Primary circle is always the primary. OK. And so one more minute. Just one more minute. Yep, yep. So uh, my last slide. Anyway, so we did a few couple of experiments. We said, look, having found this, uh, these uh, primary circle and other features, let's hard code those features into the model and, and allow it to run with those, with those features. And so what that allowed is, well, it speeded up training, as you can see, in factor two for MNIST, factor 3.5 for a much harder data set, which is this house numbers data set. Um, but the most interesting thing, <laughs> well, Rickard, my co-author, told me that when you try to, when you tune a model, you train a model on MNIST and try to apply it to house numbers, you get 10% accuracy on the classification. In other words, it's just like random. Okay. Disappointing situation. Okay. So now what we found is though that if we trained it in this hard-coded, uh, you know, primary circle thing in there, we got the generalization up to 22%. Obviously not where you want to be. I think there's a lot more that can be done this way. I think one should build a deeper network for SVHN, and one should also include the Klein bottle, not just the circle. And uh, I believe that you know, much can be done by introducing these features that we understand and get to a generalization. Okay, so I'll stop us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's take, uh, let's take one, one or two, one minute, one and a half minutes for maybe two questions. Who's got two questions for, one question for Gunnar? All right, yeah, I got a quick question. So, um, as you're kind of aware, there's a lot of work going on in this like AI right now. Yep. Um, so, do you believe you that? You, up, Ryan? Yeah. Do you believe that you can actually utilize kind of this approach to understand yeah. error as it propagates through the network? Uh, through uh, a deep net? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't see why not. Uh, I mean, exactly how you would do that. I, I mean, we'll have to talk about the particular problem. But um, I think what you can do is you can understand what it's doing because you can treat these networks as feature networks, and so you can color them by the individual data points. Right. So you can actually see what's, what's going on. Down and and ideally, nice. use that to build much smaller. Much more All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.